It's my great pleasure to kick off this spring's Newton series by introducing tonight's speaker, Ben Horowitz, who's going to be in conversation with our, our very own Mike Franklin, who's the Siebel Professor of Computer Science and Director of the AMP Lab here at Berkeley. So Ben was born in London, but he grew up right here in Berkeley. He doesn't live here, I understand, anymore. Although he doesn't, doesn't live here anymore, he's, a, I understand, a frequent visitor to the East Bay, and in particular, a diehard Raiders fan. At least until they moved to Las Vegas. Uh, from, from Berkeley, Ben went on to study computer science at, at my alma mater, Columbia University in New York, and then got his master's degree at, at UCLA. And after graduation there, he began to work at Netscape, where he made the now infamous connection with uh, Mark Andreessen. At Netscape, um, he established himself as a coach and as a business guru, um, co-writing a paper that I think at least some of you have seen called Good Product Manager, Bad Product Manager. After Netscape was sold to AOL, Ben and Mark, along with um, Insik Ree, who's a Berkeley alum and a Sitarja Center advisory board member, went on to found LoudCloud, an enterprise software company. The company survived near death, successfully turned around as Opsware, and sold to HP for 1.7 billion in 2007. After that, Ben and Mark launched Andreessen Horowitz two years later. As a managing partner, Ben was key in introducing the VC firm's new business model, coaching entrepreneurs to become CEOs. Ben continues to share the lessons he's learned along the way via his blog that I'm sure many of you have seen, um, via his recent book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, and at various forums here on campus, including last year's uh, CS commencement and, of course, uh, this forum tonight. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ben Horowitz and Mike Franklin. Thank you. All right. All right. You have all these treats up here for me? <laughs> yep. You got a banana? Bananas. That would be very cash for me to eat a banana while I'm up here. <laughs> <laughs> Potassium is good for me, so let's see. All right. Well, great. Well, uh, Ben, thanks for uh, coming to visit us here uh, in your hometown. Um, so uh, prior to uh, this event, um, the students were asked uh, to submit questions All right. that they had for you, All right, which makes my job a lot easier. All right. And um, one thing I did is I, I tried to categorize them into, into a few different uh, topics. Uh, so there were a lot of questions about uh, life lessons, things that uh, people can learn from, from your uh, life, given your, uh, this- All the uh, mistakes I've made. All the mistakes you've made. In fact, they, people ask a lot of questions about failure and how you <laughs> dealt with it. I'm not sure if yeah. that had anything to do with you I in wrote particular. I a whole book about that. Yeah, I think they read your book. Yeah. Um, a lot of questions about advice for budding entrepreneurs, because mm -hmm. uh, we have several of them in the audience. Um, a lot of people had questions about this mysterious thing called the venture capital business. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's some questions there. And then um, a lot of questions um, about where you see technology going, where you see uh, markets going. Great. So I'll uh, try to do a survey of, of some of those uh, different topics. And then uh, towards the end of the um, event, we'll uh, open up the floor for, for any questions that, that, that I missed. All right, great. All right, great. So let's start with life lessons. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, um, you went to Berkeley High School, and has already been pointed out, was uh, your- Yellow Jackets and Yellow Jackets. <laughs> <laughs> right. A big Raiders fan, um, yeah, yeah. which, you know, we could have another discussion about that. Um, but I think uh, it'd be good for everyone to hear a little bit about your story of uh, sort of how uh, you went from Berkeley High School, uh, you know, through yeah. uh, where you got to- Today. Sure. Oh, okay. Well, it's the whole However story. How far you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> We've only got an hour. So. Well, yeah. So, well, I, uh, you know, I graduated from Berkeley High, and, and you can, you have to imagine um, growing up in Berkeley and then leaving Berkeley because you guys, a lot of you probably came to Berkeley and you're like, wow, this place is weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and when you grow up here, though, like that's normal. That's like, oh yeah, everybody's a communist. Of course they are. <laughs> People smoke weed on the corner. It's no, no thing. It's you know, and and that was just kind of how life was growing up. And then when I went to school in New York, it was just uh, 
it was shocking. I, I just say like extremely shocking uh, going to New York in the 80s. And um, as an undergraduate, the, you know, probably the most challenging thing that you have is you really want to fit in, particularly if you go to a college like I did where I didn't have any friends going there. I was just like showing up and you're like, oh, you're going to show up in a new city and you don't know anybody and you're from a weird hippie kind of town. Uh, and so I show up there and, um, you know, I really want to make friends. But um, as that I get into it, like you have to be careful because like friends, like your friends in college are like kind of stupid. Um, <laughs> and, Depends on what college and, you and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you what I mean. <laughs> well, they're stupid about what you should do with your life. Let, let me put it that way. Um, and that, that, that's kind of like probably my most important life lesson at Columbia was learning to think for myself. And, and I kind of ran into it because in those days, um, computer science was kind of like not, like now it's like a cool major. Um, like people think, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> you're going into computer science. You're, you're even taking computer science class. That's smart. Um, but back then, uh, you know, and I think it's we misnamed the field. You know, like because people thought computer science was kind of like automotive engineering. Like that's what it sounded like to people back then. And so when I started to take these classes in computer science, I was like, wow, this is like really interesting. And then. Um, and I hadn't even declared my major yet, and I, I take this class, uh, you know, the, the class about the kind of theoretical machines, the push down automata. Some of you guys are computer science majors, and you learn about Alan Turing, and you're like, wow, this guy did this proof. And he proved that if you make a computer that's like Turing complete, then you can compute anything. And that means that, like, there's going to be one machine that, like, is the machine, like, that does everything. And you got to remember, like, this is 1984. And so at that time, there wasn't one machine. There were, like, we had typewriters, calculators, cameras, television sets. Like, we had a machine for everything. Like, everything you could possibly think of, we had a machine for. And so, like, it was just, even though Alan Turing is, like, 40 years before then, I'm reading about this going, wow, this guy has a secret that's going to happen to the world that nobody knows about but me. Like, that's awesome. I'm going to major in computer science. And I was like, so fired up. And then I go kind of back to my dorm room, and I tell my uh, kind of, they call them suite mates. You know, you're not roommates, but you're in the suite together. I'm like, hey, I'm going to major in computer science. And they're like, wow, you're an idiot. <laughs> it's like, you can go to DeVry, and they'll teach you how to, like, fix computers, program computers, you know, do maintenance on them. Like, why would you major in that? You don't have to go. You can go to DeVry. You don't have to go to Columbia for that. And I was like, wow, you guys are idiots. Um, and so, but that was, that was when I kind of learned that, like, even though I really wanted them to like me because they were my friends, I wasn't going to listen to them. Uh, and that, that, that little lesson is kind of the key to everything else um, that I think happened to me in my life. Because every time you have a breakthrough idea, like a really innovative idea, um, by definition, it's going to look like a stupid idea. Because if it looked like a good idea, guess what? It wouldn't be innovative. It wouldn't be something that nobody else thought of. It would be something that everybody else already knew and was obvious. And so if you have an idea, like, I have got an idea to build a company, you tell somebody and they go, wow, that's a great idea. You should find a different idea. <laughs> because if they can see it, right, then, like, uh, you know, if they can see it like that, you know, without you really explaining the secret or the knowledge, the special thing that you've learned that got you to that idea, then, um, then it's, it's probably a problem. And one of my favorite quotes is uh, Steve Case said, uh, who was the old kind of founder of AOL, which uh, was an important company at one point. <laughs> but uh, he, said the diff he said, you know the difference between a vision and a hallucination. And I'm like, what, Steve? He says, they call it a vision when other people can see it. And, uh, and that is really so true. Like, a lot of times, you will figure something out, and nobody else will be able to see it, and they will all think you're hallucinating. Um, and so that, that was probably kind of, kind of the big breakthrough for me. And so from there, uh, you know, I just kind of did what I thought 
um, was smart and I got an internship at this company, Silicon Graphics, and I went there and I was like, wow, like everybody here is like the smartest person I've met. Like I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna live in Silicon Valley and I'm definitely gonna like build these like awesome machines that we're like making the Terminator on. Um, and so I did that and like a lot of my friends were like, oh, you should sell insurance like me. Uh, and I was like. <laughs> go to Wall Street, I, I assume. I was like, yeah, go to Wall Street, yeah. sell insurance, be a stockbroker, yes. like be an investment banker. I was like, you guys are stupid. Like I'm working on the Terminator. You're like <laughs> selling bonds. Now, now when you say working yeah. on the Terminator, you don't actually mean the ter you mean the movie The Terminator, the movie, not, the Terminator. not actually yeah, yeah. building Terminator. So yeah, so I, I should explain okay. that. So just to clarify, in the '80s when I was at Silicon Graphics, so Silicon Graphics was kind of the company that invented modern computer graphics, and one of the first applications was kind of rendering, um, kind of the original kind of CGI stuff in the movies, and one of the first really awesome movies was Terminator One, um, which was done all on Silicon Graphics computers. And so that was, uh, that was really great. And then, you know, my career, and then, you know, a, a, as my career went on, um, I, uh, I was at Lotus, and um, I first saw this thing, Mosaic, <laughs> uh, which uh, was quite eye-opening, because we were working on a product called Notes, and it had taken years and years and years and years to build Lotus Notes. Um, and what Lotus Notes had done in the most kind of complex way imaginable, like Mosaic was doing, and, and, and proprietary, Mosaic was doing all of that, but in a completely open and totally simple way. And I was like, oh my God, that's the future. <laughs> I'm in the past, <laughs> I've got to go. And so uh, I uh, kind of applied for a job at a company called Netscape, where the founder, um, who's my friend Mark Andreessen, uh, the, the guy who, built Mosaic was, and I, I got to meet Mark, and, and that was really interesting because uh, I, I swear to this day, the reason that Mark invented the browser was because in those days, there just wasn't enough for him to read. Because like this guy is like seriously the fastest reader you've ever seen in your life. Like I'll go on a plane ride with him and he'll read like six books. Like in one, in one leg, I'm like, what, what, what are you doing? You're turning the pages faster than I can like turn the pages and you're reading. So that, that's definitely why he invented the browser. And I think all great inventions like serve the needs of the inventor <laughs> a little bit. And so that one definitely spiritually uh, served that need. The other kind of interesting thing about Mark is he's like a super fast typist. So like when we were at, uh, when we founded um, LoudCloud together, my, uh, the admins were having a type, were taking the typing test and they were kind of racing each other, and my admin typed like 73 words a minute, his admin typed like 75 words a minute. And I was like, Mark, why don't you take the test? And they, you know, and they also mistakes. So again, one of them had three mistakes, the other had two mistakes. And I'm like, Mark, go ahead, take the test. He takes the test, 147 words a minute. One mistake, he says, that wasn't a mistake. There's a grammatical error in the test. I corrected it. <laughs> so, so. He, so, was, he was like very impressive in that way. He's so, got other issues though. <laughs> well, maybe, all right, maybe we should just go straight there. Now, um, all right, we'll, we'll come back to Mark's yeah. issues. Um, so um, also on your resume, you have a master's degree. So at what yeah. point in, in, in your career did you decide that that was the right thing to do? Yeah, well, I actually got my master's right out of coming out of undergraduate and it was interesting. Um, so at Columbia, what happened was it, it was actually, uh, <laughs> Funny story, um, <laughs> public and private universities. So at Columbia, I studied computer science, but the computer science I studied at Columbia was, uh, turned out to be just very theoretical uh, at the time. And you know, we, we wrote everything in Pascal, a programming language called Pascal, which uh, nobody in any company used at the time. And um, we learned a lot of theoretical stuff, but we didn't get a chance to do that much practical stuff. And then the computers that we had, which is very important, kind of to the whole thing was a, uh, the DEC, uh, DEC that we were running, uh, they, they called them the DEC 20, DECnet 20 mm -hmm. operating system, which also was like getting to be a more obscure operating system. And so when I went to Silicon Graphics and we were on Unix and I was programming in C, um, stuff was just like really different. And I was, I felt like I was quite a bit underprepared uh, to be an en engineer there. Um, and so that, 
Well, okay, I got another story about that. So I'm a summer intern at Silicon Graphics, and I'm working on, at that time, we're building the first parallel machine. So prior to like the late 80s, every computer was like one processor, mm -hmm. um, and not like multi-core, just like one <laughs> processor. And so the operating system itself, um, you know, there's one, just time slice between the processor, there was no contention, there was no like semaphores and those kinds of things. And so we were taking the Silicon Graphics operating system and making it multi-processor ready. So we had to put semaphores on the kernel and, and whatnot. And I'm, <laughs> you know, my job is to basically break the operating system because I don't know how to program. So like, that's a good job for me. So I would write, they're just like write programs, you know, exercise the device drivers, break stuff. And so I'd be breaking and cause the kernel panic. And so I'd get a kernel panic and it would dump out, you know, like when the kernel panics, you don't have any tools. So uh, you just got a hexadecimal dump of what was in memory. And I'd have this thing I'd be looking at. And I was like, like, how are we supposed to figure out what went wrong? So I'd take it to my boss. His name was Chris Wagner. I used to call him Black Wagner because he killed bugs dead like Black Flag, <laughs> you know, the, the roach spray. And I'd take it to Chris and he goes, Oh, he's looking at the hex up. Oh, that address there, that's got a value in it. That should be a pointer. Like, somebody stomped on the pointer. That's what's wrong. And I was like, you memorized every, like, <laughs> line of the memory of the operating system? Like, what's running? He's like, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, man, I am so underprepared. So that's what caused me to go to UCLA to get my master's degree. And... UCLA did actually quite a good job of preparing me to be an engineer. I learned um, it was, I'd say, a much better computer science curriculum uh, than, uh, than Columbia. And I got to meet Professor Kleinrock, who uh, um, some of you know invented the internet, basically, not Al Gore. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> he actually did the math that um, proved that like packet switching would work, which uh, you can almost think of it a little like Alan Turing proving that the general purpose computer would work. So people had an idea like, oh, yeah, like maybe packet switching would work. And they, you know, you'd have a philosophical conversation about it. But nobody actually worked on those kind of networks. And in fact, AT&T, which was the most powerful company in the world, like was completely run on this um, kind of command and control network where you'd allocate all the bandwidth for a conversation. And then you, know, you, you allocate the circuit, and then you talk over the circuit, and then you shut down the circuit. And that's how it worked. And so you could never build something that scaled like the internet or that was distributed control like the internet uh, until uh, Professor Kleinrock figured it out. And so it was great to be there with him. And, um, that was uh, why I got a master. Sorry, I'm giving you long answers. No, here, that's so. good. You keep making my job easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I have a I question for the audience, though, before yeah. we go on. So uh, who, how many of you know uh, what famous company is now headquartered in Silicon Graphics' old uh, headquarters? Does anyone know? Yeah. Not, not that many, right? Yeah, so if you've ever heard of the Googleplex, that yeah, is the Google. old uh, SGI headquarters, yeah, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah, yes, Which it is. is uh, yeah, pretty interesting. They're beautiful buildings. Yeah. <laughs> Still so, the same buildings. I think Ed McCracken, the old CEO, designed a lot of those buildings. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so one of the questions that the students asked were things that you had learned uh, in college that, that, that helped you in, in your career. And, and, and I heard sort of two main messages coming through. One was... Um, sort of having your eye out for the future and, 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 and trying to have a, a clear view of, of, of what's coming next. And the other uh, seems to be uh, having a, a, a realistic understanding of what you know and what you don't know and uh, you know, trying, to, trying to fix those things that you don't know. Yeah, that the, that, that's actually like a really good point. So like the other thing that's very hard when you're young and actually as hard as you get older too is like honesty. Um, <laughs> And that's like honesty with other people and honesty with yourself. And I know it's funny to say that. It's like, oh, so Ben, you're, you're, you have to like work to be honest. You're not a naturally honest person. And, and the truth is, like, there's not a naturally honest person in the world. Like, that just doesn't <laughs> exist. People all pretend they're honest. And if you think about it, like, if you go, am I honest? You go, yeah, I'm honest. And then you, I go, like, OK, who else do you know that's like completely honest? Pretty hard to come up with somebody, isn't it? Yeah, Because nobody really is. It's something that you have to work at. And the reason you have to work at it is kind of, you, it goes back to like you really want kind of to feel good about yourself and you really want people to like you. And the way to get people to like you is you tell them what they want to hear. 
not the truth. <laughs> you tell them what they want to hear. Uh, and that's just not honest. And that's kind of the biggest challenge that you run into if you want to lead an organization or, or go do something important is you can't lie to other people and you can't lie to yourself. Or if you do, like they see through, you might think you're being slick, <laughs> but they see through it. You know, like if you run a big organization and you're just lying all the time, people will go, okay, yeah. I get, well, I was going to drop a name, but I, I know we're videoing this, so I don't want to <laughs> make an enemy. <laughs> um, but, but you know kind of the people that I'm talking about. Um, and so that is, you, you should just know now that like telling the truth is work. Um, and you have to, when you're tempted to say the thing that people want to hear um, or say the thing that makes yourself feel better, you need to check yourself. And, and try to be honest. And uh, if you learn to do that, that, that's an amazing skill. You, you will definitely separate yourself. Cool. Uh, all right, so um, we'll continue the story a little later, but let, let's take a, a break and go in a, a couple different directions. So uh, a lot of the questions that, that, that people submitted had to do with um, uh, sort of what you were able to learn by making mistakes. So like, you know, a lot of questions like, what was the, the biggest mistake you made? What was the most valuable learning experience? Uh, you know, people are basically just trying to feel better about things they've screwed up. So how, uh, uh, you haven't, did you make any mistakes? <laughs> uh, I read your book. I think there might have been a few in there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's all, all, all mistakes. We used to have a model, all new mistakes. That's, a, <laughs> yeah. that's the key to life, all new mistakes. Um, like if you try not to make mistakes, you're not going to accomplish anything important. I mean, like that's just a a fact, and I think that that's actually one of the things that um, is a challenge with school, because in school there's a huge reward for getting all the answers right, um, and so you do kind of train yourself to want to not make mistakes. Uh, but that's a, actually a bad skill psychologically in life, um, and. We see it in entrepreneurs, like in <laughs> CEOs, like always uh, joke with each other, like we, you know, you need a, to be a really good D student to be a good CEO. Cause, <laughs> and and it sounds funny, but the, the, the truth to it is that like if you like build a company, the mean on the test is not like seventy or seventy-five. Like nobody gets a seventy. The mean on the test is like sixteen. And so like if you feel bad. <laughs> that you're only getting one out of five things right, like you're making a mistake because like that's good for like starting a company and the tons of things that you don't know how to do and like all the things that you have to do, but you want to be able to go quickly and make mistakes and learn from them and correct. And I, like I, I made so many mistakes, um, it's just ridiculous. I mean, it, it's totally, I'll tell you about like one mistake that I made that I don't even, really like to talk about. <laughs> but I made a mistake. So when we started um, the company, we Loud Cloud like grew very, very fast. The cloud computing company that I started uh, very fast. Like we booked $27 million nine months after like saying, hey, we're going to start a company. Like we booked $27 million. So, and that's when $27 million was a lot of money. Uh, and we were growing so fast that uh, the fire marshal came and said, we're going to shut down the company because you have too many people in this building. So I had to get more real estate. And this is in 1999, right at the kind of the high, height of the bubble, or early 2000. And, um, or the, the actual bubble, not this bubble, which is like a semi-bubble. That was like a full-fledged bubble. Um, and you know, my CFO goes like, okay, we've sound space, like, you know, what do you think? And rather than like spending 10 minutes, like really understanding that, I was just like, okay, if you found it and you think it's the right thing, let's go. So we leased the space, $30 million, $30 million letter of credit to like secure the space, $10 per square foot in 2000 within six months, the dot com crash ha happened and that space was worth 99 cents a square foot. And I had like a $30 million commitment to stay in it for 10 years. Um, and that $30 million just haunted me for years and years and years and years. And the whole time I'm just thinking, wow, if I had spent 10 minutes 
I would have saved myself like years of like waking up in the middle of the night sweating, going, what the fuck did I do? So, uh, you know, like that was just one of the mistakes I made, but I made like tons of mistakes like that. And, you know, like if you try and do something really hard, you're gonna make a lot of mistakes. And, it, you know, entrepreneurship is very much like um, scientific discovery. So if you read about any of the great scientific discoveries, they almost never found what they were looking for, right? Like you're, you're going to do one thing and then all of a sudden, oh, this works for that. You know, you're trying to cure heart disease and you invent Viagra or whatever. <laughs> but <clears throat> um, <laughs> maybe that's not a great example. <laughs> but entrepreneurship is like, you rarely end up doing what you set out to do. And so like by definition, like the whole endeavor is a big mistake. Uh, uh, well, I'll give you a really good example. So I invest in this company called TinySpec. Um, and the company, it was founded by this guy. He's really a great guy. He had founded a company called Flickr. Um, and any of you guys still know what Flickr is? So, and Flickr actually started out as a massive multiplayer online game um, that he was trying to build in 2001. And he was like, it was him and his wife and they were in Canada and like he like didn't have the resources to do it. So like the avatar like uploader um, thing was like all that they really got working well and so like, and that was Flickr. <laughs> uh, and so and they sold that company to Yahoo for like whatever, $30 million. And uh, so then here we were like 10 years later and he was gonna make the game again. And this game was called Glitch. Uh, and so he builds Glitch, and I love Glitch. It was like a marvelous game. He builds Glitch, but Glitch had two major problems. One is he started it in 2006 and built it on Flash before like Steve Jobs declared war on Flash. So like it wasn't gonna work on like the iPhone. Uh, and then uh, the other problem um, was like people would finish the game in like two days. And so that, that's not very good for retention. Um, and so he's at that point and he's got six million dollars left and he calls me, he says, Ben, like I've got six million dollars left. Um, I'm not, I have no like way to raise money because I've made really no progress because of these issues. It's gonna cost me more than six million dollars to finish the game. So I've got like three choices. I can like pray for rain and try and finish it. I can shut down the company and give you your six million dollars back or we built this tool that we use like in our engineering team to like communicate with each other and make like engineering work a little better. Um, and I could like just put that out as a product. And I'm like, what? I was like, you just like built some tool to like talk to each other and like you want to put that as a product and you're like a consumer guy and you want to become an enterprise software guy. He's like, yeah, I think it'd be a pretty good idea. I was like, well, I was like, like $6 million is, it's not gonna make any difference in my life. If you really think it's a good idea and you really want to do that, go ahead. <laughs> so he puts the game out, the, the tool out. It's called Slack. Yeah. Um, and it grows like <laughs> fastest growing enterprise software company of all time. So you know, that, big mistake, you know, like building Glitch. Um, but you know, these, these are the things you do. And a lot of the processes, do you have a secret? Do you know something that nobody else knows? And because he was like pulling his hair out, like literally smoking like eight packs of cigarettes a day trying to get Glitch out the door, like he was doing everything to optimize that development. And so he learned where software development was suboptimal. Like he discovered a secret in the process of trying to build the game. And it's that secret that led to the company. And that's a really big key is you have to go do something really hard if you wanna learn something about the world that nobody, it's not that nobody else knows it, but almost nobody else knows it, and nobody else who does know it is acting on it. And that's when you have a breakthrough, and that's when you have something that you can go like build a company around or do something uh, really important around. But it kind of starts with hard work. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, it, it's funny, sometimes I talk to my wife about this, but like hard work is like super important in life. And like now, like I grew up like in Berkeley, I didn't have any money, I played for the football for the Yellow Jackets, I was just like a kid in the neighborhood. And now like I have a lot of money. And so like with my kids, I'm like, okay, now that I'm rich, how do I teach you the value of hard work? Because that's really the only important lesson that I've got. Uh, but like for all of you, I think uh, most of you at a public university probably know a little of the value of hard work. Keep that lesson, that's the important, that, that work is what's important. Um, it's that effort where you 
learn the secrets that are super valuable and can change uh, people's lives and change the world. Yeah, yeah, and also I think uh, you know the other thing is, uh, like you said, trying to do something that's hard. Yeah. And uh, right before we came over here, Ben was over at the Amp Lab meeting a bunch of the students <laughs> yeah, there. So, and some of the things were so hard, I was like, <laughs> you got to be kidding. Every time somebody said what they were working on for their yeah. research, he, Ben was like, that sounds really hard. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, and, and along the way, you discover things. You know, maybe you get to where you're trying to get, but, you know, if not, you'll get to someplace interesting, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, I think I'm going to switch gears from the life lessons uh, topic, and if people have more questions towards the end, we can, we sure. can go there. So um, there were a bunch of questions uh, just around uh, venture capital and um, um, how, how you view uh, venture capital and, and investing. Um, so um, maybe we'll start off with just sort of your general philosophy for in investments. What do you, how do you look at yeah, so opportunities? It is different than other kinds of investing in the sense that, um, right, if you're investing in a restaurant, you know, you're not really like banking on a profound invention usually, right? You know, it's kind of, well, maybe somebody's like invented a better guacamole or whatever, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's kind of like a pretty contained, understandable problem. Like you make the restaurant, if your food tastes better than the next guy and you can get more people into your restaurant or like the cool people, you know, you can uh, have some like cool, like Taylor Swift shows up or whatever, and then all of everybody goes, oh, that's the hot club right there, and I'll go. Um, and that's, that's like the restaurant business. So like that's a different kind of investing. If you're investing in like breakthrough inventions, um, then there's not really, like, you know, with Slack, like, not only did we not invest in it, but like what, we, what was the business model, like how it was gonna work. Um, and you know another company that uh, actually was came out of was one of the founders um, Scott Schenker, who some of you probably know, a professor here, was one of the founders called Nasira Networks that I invested in. And you know today they're I think their last quarter they're on like a six hundred million dollar run rate. Um, but when I saw them, like they didn't have any idea what, even what the product was. It was just like like we've invented this thing where like we can now. Uh, separate the control plane and the data plane on networks and like and this guy Martin Casados like he worked at the NSA and built networks and he found all the limitations of network and so he was like none of the networking technology works for what we need to do here so he goes to Stanford and gets his PhD and figures it out and then like he's got this goo <laughs> and like we're gonna try and make it into a company um, well, what's a product? Well, eh, we don't know yet. It could be this, it could be that, it could be whatever. Um, but so in that case, right, like I'm not investing in a business or even really in some ways a product, I'm investing in a secret. Um, so they had a secret uh, that they had earned, <laughs> like not just a, like a, and people will often when they're pitching me will make up like that they have a secret. They're good storytellers. <laughs> so you kind of have to go through and say like, well, how did you earn this secret? Like what very hard work did you do to get to that point? Um, and, and that's a lot what we're looking for. And some of it, the process of finding the secret, the determination is the same kind of determination that you'll need to, to go on to build a company or, or do something like that. Um, and you know, so that's kind of at a very basic level what we invest in. We invest in who we think are special people with like some with a really important secret. And and the investments that we make like that generally do very well. And when we get carried away or get caught up in some uh, trend about like how kids are behaving, that's when we lose all our money. So. <laughs> Uh, so that's generally how venture capital works, or that's the general idea behind it. And then um, after we invest, then the thing is you have this inventor, um, but that inventor hasn't actually built a company, hasn't become a CEO or an entrepreneur. And so how do you, and, and we have a philosophy that, uh, and I personally have a philosophy that the very best companies are run by the founder inventor. Um, and so if you look at the great technology companies over in history, from IBM to Hewlett Packard to Oracle to Microsoft to Google to Facebook, um, 
they're all run by their founders. Uh, but you know, in the kind of history of venture capital, the big skill that the venture capitalists traditionally had was removing the founder and inserting the professional CEO. And so the design of our firm and the big kind of reason why we exist is we wanted to build a firm that enabled the inventor to become a CEO. And that sort of, there's really two basic parts to it. One is, um, are the people who invest in you, are they money guys or are they people who have built companies? So everyone who is an investor at our firm has founded and run a company. Um, and so like we know what the process is, so we can help the inventor learn the CEO skill set, which is a weird skill set. And then the second part is um, professional CEOs have a very broad network, uh, which they can, you know, they know executives, they know people in the press to promote the product, they know people in the capital markets to raise money and so forth. So we try and basically simulate that network for the entrepreneur and we've built a kind of a, a very unique looking firm in that we have sort of eight investing partners and then 130 people in the firm and the other 122 are all the network and every other venture capital firm is primarily investing people. Uh, and the reason for that is we want the inventor to have the network of a professional CEO. So that's, you know, and then that was just my experience from being a founder and having my venture capital firm say to me, Ben, when is your company gonna get a real CEO? <laughs> and I'm like, well, a, what am I, top liver? <laughs> so. <laughs> but that, I screwed up the company so bad nobody would take the job, so I ended up doing this. So, so uh, when a technical founder shows up, maybe a first-time entrepreneur, and uh, how important is it that they uh, give a credi credible business plan, go-to-market strategy, market sizing? I mean, uh, are you guys able to look past that stuff? Or well, it depends on the stage. Uh, okay. It depends on the stage. So, like, look, if, if somebody's coming and they've like got an invention and uh, and it's profound. Um, and they're like, you know, they just started the company, then yeah, we would look past that stuff uh, for sure. Although it helps, a lot of like, you know, it does show, you know, you'd like them to have the curiosity to have at least done some of the work to think about like how they're gonna go to market. Although the Nasir guys did not really think yeah. very hard about it, I have to say. <laughs> um, but like if they're coming, you know, for their third round of funding, um, and they still don't know how they're going to go to market. That that is a problem, uh, and you know because you know at some point you do have to build a company, or you're going to go bankrupt and lay off all your employees and be really sad, and have a like a really heartfelt blog post that explains the whole thing. <laughs> so so there was a really nasty question in the in the list of questions that I want to ask. Right. Um, <laughs> so uh, you you do a lot of investment in in data and, and analytics and things like that, and and the, and the question was. Uh, do you use uh, data and analytics in making investment decisions? Um, we do, uh, we do, and that's not a nasty question. <laughs> there are, so there, there's different limitations. So the, there's some things that like uh, we can do pretty strong analytics on like, you know, there, there'll be categories that come up like, okay, so like there's social networking is a thing for a while where there's a lot of important new companies and you can look at, um, you know, well, you can say, okay, you know, like what's the viral coefficient, um, which is kind of how fast does the, does it, uh, does the product spread on its own organically? Um, you can look at, uh, you know, and you can compare, um, you know, things like, not just monthly active and weekly actives, but like how many, you know, did they, how many people use it five days out of seven, you know, during the week and not on weekends, and how many use it two days out of seven and so forth. And, you know, you, you can do that in like a category like that, but the interesting thing is by the time you really get your model, like is there gonna be, I'll ask you guys, is there gonna be another like social networking company now? Like, or is Snapchat it? Like, is that the last one? <laughs> because it's kind of hard now that Facebook is as powerful as it is, and like, and plus you have Snapchat, plus you have Twitter, um, to kind of get enough oxygen to build a whole new social network, and that does tend to be how it goes. Like, you know, somebody comes up with a new category, and by the time you can really analyze that category as a venture capitalist, that 
category is somewhat over. So now like we're on to virtual reality and quantum computing and self-driving cars and social networks, that's passe. You know, like you didn't invest in that now. I mean, like you'll just lose all your money. So you, you do kind of have that challenge. Uh, and, um, you know, and just generally, like what's the last really important mobile application that was built that's just like an app after Snapchat? Um, I'm not sure, it's been a while, <laughs> you know, but that's what happens, you know, like you build a platform, there's a wave of applications, and then there's gotta be another wave of like basic computers, you know, like hardcore computer science breakthroughs, new platforms, uh, new research, and then there can be another application wave. And so, you know, and, and for the computer science oriented things like, well, like Databricks, I mean like, so <laughs> we invested in Databricks out of the AMP lab, uh, really interesting company, but there wasn't that much, you know, like, yeah, we could do analytics on like, okay, how is the open source community growing? But like, we knew the open source community was growing because like everybody was talking about it. Like, I didn't have to even do the analytics to know that. Um, but what you really had to do is go, okay, how much better is this, um, like at a technical level than everything else? Like how, you know, how long is it gonna last? Will it take out MapReduce um, and then, you know, and then you could look at the numbers in the open source community and whatnot and, and see how it's going. But that, you know, that was like a, a little more secondary. Yep. That's why I thought it was a nasty question. Because <laughs> <laughs> I thought, yeah, good. It's a good question. I mean, you know, like, yeah. it's one of these things where, like, uh, th there's kind of a thing that, like, if you're a computer scientist, like, you know, like everybody's subject to Moneyball, right? Like, we're going to wipe out all the jobs, just going to be computers doing them. And, like, uh, that's true for a lot of jobs. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and, and I think data improves almost any job, even, even ours for sure. Um, but there are, you know, when it's early enough, there's not that much data to analyze. Great, so uh, we don't have that much time left. I want to take advantage well, of- You can also uh, analyze oh. where people graduate from schools. Though. So the founders, <laughs> there's a lot of like founder analysis stuff going on and yep. um, some guys are like, oh, do you think we can get their SAT scores and whatnot? <laughs> 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 Those aren't that easy to extract. Uh, Right. Although the guys who graduate from IIT, do you guys know about IIT, the Indian Institute of Technology? They all have a number. <laughs> and if you ask them the number, they'll tell you the number. It's kind of part of the culture, <laughs> which is interesting. Although I don't find that number is that correlated to how good right. an entrepreneur they are. And if you, if you ask them somebody else's number, they know yeah. that too. Yeah. <laughs> so they literally on the test, they rank them like one through whatever, 2,500 or however many people they let in. Oh, and so like, yeah. 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 And so they'll go like, I'm number 367. And you're like, wow, that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty cool. Yeah. All right, cool. So um, just to, as we're getting close to, to the end of our time here, um, you know, you see a lot of what's going on in the Valley, a lot of the, the latest innovation. So I just want to get, you know, your, your, your feelings on, um, you know, what industries uh, are you looking at? Uh, where do you see uh, the most potential for innovation, for disruption? What are you excited about? Yeah, well, so there's, uh, we actually just launched a um, bio fund. And the reason we did is uh, computational biology is getting super interesting in, in many, many dimensions. So that, that's probably the thing that I'm most excited about as a human being is <laughs> like if I was, uh, 20, I think I'd certainly try to be a biohacker um, because it is like the, the, the ability to uh, use information science and biology and use computer science techniques to um, do things. It's just so like mind blowing. Like everything that you see is just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And like how like incredible. Uh, you guys would be horrified if you knew how like medicine worked today. Um, so for example, MRI, you guys know what an MRI is where they take like a magnetic uh, image of you and so forth. So when they like, when you get an MRI and they're like looking for like a problem, they're looking for a problem. They're like looking, like they're literally, like a human is looking at the picture and going, oh, there's a gray dot there. <laughs> and you're like, what? Like really? Like you, you don't have like uh, computer vision and machine? No, no, not at all. And so that, and that feeds back and everything to like, okay, what does the resolution of the image have to be? Well, it only has to be as good as like a technician can see. Um, so, you know, there's just like so much room for improvement in every facet of, uh, of biology right now through um, a lot of the work that a lot of you guys are doing. So like that's super interesting. 
And uh, do any of you guys follow quantum computing? So the kind of, for those of you who don't, kind of the way to think about it is, you probably read that Moore's Law is starting to run out. And the reason it's running out is kind of, we're down to like, what, 12 nanometers or something. And so like, as you get to uh, the size of an atom, right, Newtonian physics stops working. And now you're into like quantum physics. And so like, you can't get smaller because like the computers will break literally because the laws of physics change. <laughs> How cool is that? Um, that we got that small. But I mean, <laughs> it was very cool for me who remembers punch cards and all that. Uh, but so now there's uh, basically computers using the properties of quantum mechanics, and quantum physics. Um, so you're building like a quantum, like literally a quantum computer. And they have these like really outrageous properties, like they're 100 million times faster than a regular computer, but they don't always get the right answer. <laughs> and you don't know if they have the right answer. Um, so they're really good for things where uh, uh, false positives don't matter, like say cracking encryption, <laughs> um, where you can just keep trying, <laughs> and you go, oh, I got the key. You know, so so that's very scary for like the world of computing, in that if somebody builds a quantum computer that cracks encryption, then basically all security on the internet goes away like overnight. Uh, so, uh, sorry, that was a horror story. I shouldn't tell you that. <laughs> it's not nice to tell these things to the kids. Um, but there's, yeah, there, there, there's just a, an amazing number of really interesting things going on. I, I think that this is probably, um, you know, it's one of the greatest times to be entering the world uh, in that, you know, at, in one dimension, like human potential is being unlocked. You've got people from all over the world who have access to education and information that never did. Um, you know, people in places like, you know, Bangladesh and, you know, rural parts of China that, like, weren't even part of the connected to the world that are now, like, completely connected and in it. And then you've got um, these incredible, this platform where everybody's got a supercomputer in their pocket. Like, that, that, that's bananas. I mean, you guys are like, ah, we've had that since junior high. What are you talking about? Uh, but, you know, that's going on. And then, you know, quantum computing and... Uh, computational biology. It's just like the, the world's probably never been this good to enter, particularly as an engineer. So congratulations. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, great. great. I think on that upbeat note, we'll uh, open the floor to, uh, to questions. Is that right? Yeah. Great. Right. Thanks, so Ben. We'll take about uh, 10, minutes of, 10 to 15 minutes of questions, depending on you all. And then, um, uh, and then if people want to come up afterwards, we'll have about another 10 minutes to do that. So questions? Yeah. And thank you for waiting for the, hopefully in the California side, thank you for waiting for the microphone so we can hear. Hi. Hi, hello, hi. 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 Okay, cool. Hi, my name is Linda, and I'm a student here at Haas. And one of my really good friends who I met four years ago at a bank in New York, um, she goes to MIT. She's one of your biggest fans All out right. there. Uh, no, I said, hey. <laughs> I'll tell her that. So I texted her, guess who's in the room today? And I asked her what question she had for you. All right. And so her question is, what makes you different from other people? And as in, what is it about you that defines who you are and slash has made you successful? Thanks. Yeah, so like, I, that, that, that's a very flattering question. I appreciate it. I, I, I think it's my charm and good looks. Um, now, I, I would say the one thing that uh, I, I learned to do pretty early on that has been just incredibly helpful is just to be myself. And I talked a, like, a lot about this in different ways going up to this. But um, look, when you get to college, like the immediate thing is you just feel weird. You're like, wow, I do things differently than like all the other kids here. And I'm like, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily fit in. I don't even like, you know, I, I would like obsess about like little things like do, you know, like do people put a plastic bag or a paper bag in the garbage, you know, when they take it out and stuff like how, how was I raised? Was I raised by wolves? Did I, you know, like you just feel so weird, like kind of coming outside of your hometown and, and, and being somewhere like foreign. And like learning to just go, like everybody's weird. <laughs> and like if you be who you are, then you know, it turns out that over time people like that a lot better. 
and you'll do a lot better with yourself because you don't always have to think, how am I supposed to be? You can use all that brain power to think about something useful. Some questions. Uh, hey, my name is Liam. I'm a chemical engineer, and I'm extremely interested in material science, nanotechnology in particular. Um, my question is, when someone pitches a technology or a company to you that's kind of entirely different from something you've seen before, what experts do you guys call on uh, to get more background on the technology itself? I can't imagine that you have you know, the full range of everything in the world covered with who you imply now. So what's your first resource that you reach out to? Yeah, so like it really ends up, that's a great question. It really ends up having to be a, like an actual domain expert in that in that area, and we have a big network of them, um, some of them from the AMP lab, uh, where we'll call somebody who really knows what they're doing um, to evaluate it. But you know, there are areas, and, and we're like at this point, um, I don't want to say this without sounding arrogant, but we can call most people. Like most people will take the call. Um, and so we'll just like say, well, like who's done important work in this field, and we'll call them. Or we'll know. So I mean, you know, we, we tend to, to know people, but we don't rely necessarily on just people we know. We we do uh, try to find the very best expert that, that we can get access to. And sometimes, look, sometimes the best experts um, do have trouble seeing the breakthrough. I think Max Planck had a great quote. He said, uh, science advances one funeral at a time. <laughs> and, and part of the reason is, like, if you learn the old way, it's really hard to like appreciate the new way. And computer science has like a long history of this. Like I can remember like people were like, higher level programming languages, men program in assembly. Like that's the only way to get the performance out of the machine. And like that was like a raging debate when I was a kid. I'm like, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> You're gonna jump, <laughs> you know, like you guys probably haven't had to take assembler. But <laughs> we make them do so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, yeah. So Hi, I was wondering if you have um, a refreshed opinion about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Um, Mike Hearn just left the whole developer community and oh, you guys well, over, are... over the block size, the block size debate. Are you asking me over the block size debate? Yeah, like, is that going to destroy Bitcoin? Just if it's too sort of like early for the world to adopt cryptocurrencies. Yeah, so I don't think it's a, so that's a great question. Um, I'm just going to answer it without kind of explaining everything that you just said. Uh, so the, the world adoption kind of problem is just more of an issue, I would say. It's not the my current issue. It's an issue of there being like enough interesting applications for people to adopt it. And those haven't been built out yet. And like there needs to be more infrastructure to do it. It's actually very hard to build a Bitcoin application that's good today, you know, the tools and, you know, so just in the evolution of it, we're not that far along. And the way to think, the way I think about it is, you know, if you think about the internet, um, you know, Kleinrock had his breakthrough in 62, TCP IP was invented in 1973, and then it was 20 years until Mosaic. Um, and, you know, Bitcoin, if you think of the Bitcoin protocol as the equivalent of TCP IP, and that started in 2009, like it just takes a while for an infrastructure like that to get built out. Now that's different than um, the my current issue, which is really the control of the core code of Bitcoin and how those decisions are made. And I have to say that is worse than the way the IETF used to work, which IETF was like a miracle, like one of the greatest organizations ever. Um, and led to like you know the internet really becoming what it was, uh, where like a lot of incredibly smart people could work together and like agree on things. Um, and so Bitcoin does need an evolution in how um, the core works <laughs> uh, and how those decisions are made. But I'm not uh, apoplectic about it. Like I do think it'll get solved. Like I think it needed a crisis to kind of unlock people going, okay, like we have to do things in a better way than this than have a couple of guys being able to decide the fate of the entire ecosystem. So we'll, we'll take two more questions. One's here, so whoever has a good last question, oh. start thinking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you talk about the um, Silicon Valley, you moved here because of like everyone here like knew things and was like a geek, and but now like the, the Education is everywhere, and we can kind of learn anything anywhere. So, do you? What do you see as the future of Silicon Valley? Do you see like that other centers coming up, and if any that you think are coming up at this and will be like Silicon Valley? Well, so China's become kind of important. <laughs> uh, 
Beijing. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I sure hope so. Like, I, I hope like the only place to build a tech company in the world is not Silicon Valley. Like, that would be, uh, um, that would be like not good for humanity. I think it's much better if it spreads out. There is like, you know, having said that, there's a very strong network effect um, in Silicon Valley in that if you're a, a great engineer, like well, let's say you're like a super gifted engineer and you grow up in Alabama or you grow up uh, in, I don't know, like San Paulo, Brazil or something, and there's not an ecosystem that's that great, where, where are you gonna go? Like you're like, okay, I wanna be world class, I wanna build like the greatest company in the world, I've got an incredible idea. Where would you go to do that? Your number one choice is gonna be Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley just tends to get a lot of the great computer scientists. Um, and I, I don't think that's gonna go away anytime soon. Um, but, you know, like, <laughs> Uh, China is real. <laughs> um, I think London is getting better. They're doing some very clever things around regulation where they're, uh, you know, like, so we've got, it's very hard to do certain kinds of work in the U.S. because of the FDA, um, you know, and, and, you know, there's challenging things with drones. There's challenging things with self-driving cars here. And so the U.K., there's challenging things with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And so they're taking the approach of like, we're gonna have a more entrepreneur friendly regulation. And so that's attracting talent to those fields. Um, Israel is, you know, like per capita has done a lot of interesting things, particularly in interestingly security because uh, they do a lot of, a lot of the guys in the Israeli government are kind of the top security experts in the world and they go into industry. And so there are other kind of ways at it, but I think Silicon Valley will be strong for a very long time. Um, unless real estate gets so expensive that only four people can live there, then. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Got one on. So uh, yeah, one towards the front, and then we can take questions uh, one by one. Uh, you mentioned right here. You mentioned <laughs> earlier that when you were at Columbia, you noticed computer science is the future. So you've got a habit of noticing something and seeing that that is the future. What properties of a product or a field do you see um, that kind of indicate this is where the future is going? Um, look, you know, it, it's a lot of, it, it, it's a complicated kind of processing thing. Um, I, I remember being like, when I first understood like about computers and how fast they were advancing, I was like terrified. I was like, oh my God, like that means, and I did the math, I was like, that means that they're gonna be like, how much more powerful, like in 20 years, I was like, oh my God, like the entire world is gonna be completely different. The world as I know it's gonna be gone. And I was, and so my first reaction was like, oh no. And then I was like, oh great, that's what I'm gonna do, <laughs> you know, like. And so I think that like, if you have like a feeling like that, like where you go, oh my God, oh my God. And I read, you know, I, when I was reading about, um, biotech and I'm like, you know, and these guys are, it's like, oh, look, we can just like uh, make a virus in a jar. I was like, oh my God. And then I was like, oh wow. Like you can just do that. And like you can just like, uh, like grow a finger <laughs> or grow like a heart, like, in, you know, like in your lab. <laughs> like how cool is that? Uh, so, you know, it's kind of like if something is just so overwhelmingly compelling and absolutely gonna happen, then it's probably gonna happen. Great. Thank you so very much for spending this time with us right now.